Hi, everyone, and welcome to the 2018 Code Talk series. This series is co-sponsored by ODTUG and IOUG and provided by Oracle Developer Advocates. Today's webinar is practical advice for taking your PL SQL testing to the next level. Presented by Stephen Forsing of Oracle Corporation with members of the UT PL SQL dev team. If you have any questions at any time during the webinar, please type them into the questions box and they'll be addressed during the Q&A period or during the presentation. Today's presentation will be recorded and available to everyone through the Code Talk page of the ODTUG website. So welcome Stephen and all pa panel members and thank you all for being here today. Thank you so much ODTUG for having us. Hello everybody, my name is Stephen Feuerstein. I'm the Oracle Developer Advocate for PL SQL from Oracle Corporation. I lead a team of developer advocates or evangelists with the intention of helping our current users make the most of Oracle database for their application development and to encourage new developers to take advantage of everything that Oracle Database has to offer. Code Talk is a monthly series of webcasts sponsored by uh, ODTUG and IUG uh, to give us an opportunity to really draw on the experiences of our community, bring them in, and have them do most of the work in the presentation so I get to sit back and watch and make jokes. But we're not gonna make any jokes today because this is a deadly serious topic, testing, testing your PL SQL code. So we did a session last year with members of the UTPL SQL version three team. UTPL SQL stands for Unit Test PL SQL. It's an open source framework that I originally built in 99 to mimic what JUnit was doing for Java developers. And it's lasted a long time. And it's fortunately in a major renaissance uh, with a, an entirely new implementation in a very modern experience compared to what we offered before. And we're lucky enough to have a few members of that team plus another very active tester on the session today. So what we wanted to do in this session was give you the sense of the experiences that these folks have had, real world experiences and, and challenges they faced in getting testing integrated into the flow of their work. Some of it will relate to UTPL SQL, but for the most part, not. And we've got a lot to cover, so we're gonna pretty much dive right in. Uh, they're gonna do, like I say, all the heavy lifting. We're gonna start with Stefan, who's gonna talk about a big challenge of what do you do when you have no development environment? You've just got production and it's time to move to a new platform. Samuel is going to talk to us about the Sith Imperial Army and the challenges they face and the testing they need to have done. Pavel will take a look at the idea of automating the process of testing and integrating it into a pipeline, a continuous integration and development pipeline. And Yasek is going to end up by really leading a roundtable conversation among the five of us around some of the controversial statements that people might say and think about testing and, and how they should be addressed. So we're just gonna, like I say, dive right in. Stefan, take it away. Thank you, Stephen. Hi, yes, I'm Stefan. Maybe you remember me from last year. I was the guy, the weird guy, who was, uh, which was using Excel to define complex unit tests for data warehouse ETLs. And with this Excel, we were generating UTPL SQL test suites. Um, if you're interested here, you can follow me via Twitter, UTPLSQLXL. XL stands not for extra large here, it's because of Excel. So, but that's not the topic for today. This was the last time. Today we want to show you how to set up regression testing. And what I did the last year, we had a big project in our company. Um, the plan was to decommission Informatica as ETL tool and the hardest challenge was, yeah, we have to do this within one year. There were 500 mappings, 200 workflows, and there was not really a plan B because the company told us in one year, we don't have Informatica anymore, Informatica anymore because we are moving to a new host. On this host, there will not be Informatica anymore. And if you don't get it, we don't have a running data warehouse anymore. So they asked us, will you get it? And well, we thought about it, oh, it's hard, but yeah, I think so, we will get it. So yeah, the slides, okay. So <laughs> maybe you remember it's a very long time ago, hopefully, 20 years ago when I was starting in data warehousing, um, yeah, there was maybe only one production database. And it was a long time that the developers said, um, yes, I, I only need production database because on production I have all the data and on any test database I cannot develop because there is 
no production data. Yeah, and hmm, yeah, maybe they also thought uh, they're cool and super programmers and they can develop directly on production because they don't write buggy code. That's the situation 20 years ago. Maybe today as well. I don't know. Next slide, please. And Stefan, I, I think that the, the other way that we might see this kind of situation in which you only had a, a production environment, there was no development environment, is when it's such an old legacy application that is not being perhaps actively maintained. And suddenly you face a challenge like we need to be off this platform in a year that you suddenly realize, oh my gosh, what's missing? So what did you do? Yeah, I want to focus what was what were the problems. In our company, we had a production database. Okay, and we also had a test database. With, but many users were on this uh, test database, and everybody did manual changes here. And always there was the question, oh, is this package which I'm having here in the test database, is it the same like in production? Is this table structure? Yeah, Is it the same like in production? I don't know. So every story uh, we did implement, the first task was synchronize everything with production database you need. Yeah, so you did manually copy the, the DDLs from uh, production database to test database. You tested something, and then you thought you're finished. Yeah, you tested it; it works. But the deployment on production has an error, and each deployment was followed by two or three hotfixes. This was the situation when I arrived there, and yeah, there was. It was clear that we cannot go on uh, with this kind of developing if we want to finish within one year here. So next slide, please. So yeah, there must be a better way or we would fail. This was clear. So um, the first step we did was we have to make sure that the code on which we are implementing is really the production code. So we refactored everything from production into uh, different scripts and we put it at, into version control system. This could be SVN or get whatever. Step two was we moved as close as possible to automated deployments. So don't do any manual things, make it automatically. So you don't have any manual errors here. And the third step was, yeah, we implemented unit and regression testing, especially in a complex data warehouse. You need something to define. This is maybe Microsoft Excel you can use to generate UTP SQL test suites. And in fact, as I remember right, we did really start with unit testing. Before we loaded everything into SVN, we started with unit testing because this is really, I think, the most important thing. Yeah? If you develop something, you need to test it. That's the most important thing. And very important as well is then to put everything into regression testing. Next slide, please. Yeah, okay. So we moved every script from production database into table scripts, view scripts, grant synonyms, triggers, packages, everything. Um, what did we use? What did we, how did we do this? We did this with um, yeah, the famous DBMS metadata package from uh, Oracle. Um, and we did some shell scripting to make it more, uh, more readable here. Um, yeah, we can have a look at what this DBMS metadata is doing here now. Let's change to the next slide. So Stefan, just to be clear, so you needed to, you had all these definitions sitting in production. You needed to generate scripts, create scripts out of that big mess that you could then use to automate the process, get it into, into uh, SV, SVN, into version control. So you chose met, DBMS metadata as the mechanism for doing that. Yeah, we use DBMS metadata to generate those files and we put it into SVN and use these files then for automatic automatic deployment with uh, Jenkins. Uh, we will show you later then. Yeah? But uh, first here uh, that you see what what's getting, if you use DBMS metadata, yeah, then you get something like this, create table and all the storage clauses and, uh, and so on. This is really not the kind of code which you uh, which you want to, deploy. This is not the kind of code 
because it's not readable and you maybe want to add some additional information, not only the create table statement, you want also have the indices, you want also have the constraints, the, the, the comments and so on. So you need to uh, do here something. You can use DBMS metadata, There's, there are some options. You can say, yeah, take storage false, segment attributes false, constraints true, constraints is also true, and so on. There are different options you can use, but uh, maybe you want to do something more. We can switch to the next slide. Next slide, please. Yeah. So at the end, you want to have something like this. Yeah? It's a small create table statement with not nulls and so on, with the correct types. You want to have the indices, the constraints, comments, the grants, maybe data as well. It depends. Maybe you want to have everything in one script. And with these scripts, you can now work. You can use these scripts to redeploy something, whatever. And you can use these scripts for automatic deployment now. So we can switch to the next slide. Just a quick comment there, Stefan. So just to make it clear, what, so Stefan built, he went in, he used DBS metadata, realized that the text coming out of DBMS metadata by default didn't give him what he needed for the scripts that would actually be used for automated deployment. Then he showed you a little bit about the tweaking that he did with DBMS metadata to get the data, the format to be more like what he wanted and then added additionally a lot more of the information that you can see here on the page. And he ended and up also with, he's, yeah. And uh, also maybe uh, you see here the, um, the variables we are maybe want to use because on uh, each different environment, you have uh, different table spaces maybe. I want to encourage you that every user should use his local database, his local environment. And you're on your local environment, environment, maybe you only have one table space and not an index table space and a data table space. So you can put here something dynamic here inside, Yeah, use variables or as well, you want to prompt uh, first, your uh, which script you are deploying that you can easily debug if it fails, that you see, okay, uh, it fails at this place. And maybe you have on production an exadata, yeah? And I, I think not every developer has his own exadata, yeah? And exadata has some more options like compression, specific compressions, and you also want to have these um, configurable, yeah? So I want to encourage you, take time take time and think about what type of scripts you really need and you really want. Great, Because Thanks. you do this one time and then you will work the next years with this kind of um, files you generated. Next slide, please. Yeah, and then next step would be to put these into automatic deployments. I would uh, use uh, Jenkins, this is open source and uh, it's very often used in many companies. Um, yeah, you can deploy different releases, whichever one you need. Maybe you want to do a hot fix for the production database, which is uh, in the moment on production, then you can deploy version 1.1 if it is in production. Maybe you want to change something which is on the way to production, yeah. So you can um, deploy whatever you want here to your local database and nobody will disturb you here. And yeah, after one year, we successfully decommissioned with this new process um, Informatica. We introduced 30,000 unit tests. It's a feeling about 80% of test coverage we built up. And yeah, what also I want to tell is uh, run the tests here as often as possible via Jenkins. Uh, it will not be possible that you test everything on every commit. Uh, if you change a table DDL, uh, th then all the tests are running. That would be not possible because uh, the tests will take a while. But uh, you have to test at least once a day in the night, uh, maybe often more uh, two or three times at daytime if it's possible. 
And if you will come into the situation that you want to performance tune your unit tests, you know you have everything done correct and well, because um, then you know you have many tests and if you are taking too long time and you want to performance tune them, this is a good sign for, yeah, I have done it very well. And with this, I want to go to Sam, who will show you how to unit test with UTP and SQL here. What, one quick question, Stefan. That 30,000 unit test is pretty amazing. I, were those all handwritten or those were generated using your Excel interface? We are only generating the uh, tests because in the complex data warehouse ETS, I, I wouldn't do this manually. You get lost. You get lost. I wanted to point that out because I don't want anybody to look at that and think, oh my gosh, how did you write all that code? So one of the key elements that Stefan has introduced is the ability to, to generate those tests. And we won't be looking at that today. Again, it was covered in the previous session a bit, uh, but certainly do follow him on Twitter and, and ask for more details. All right, yeah. let's move on to Sam because the hour will move quickly by. Yeah. Hi, uh, my name is Samuel. I'm working as software developer for Smart Enterprise Solutions, which is a tiny but pretty awesome company in Germany. Uh, I am also a husband and father, and in the remaining bit of leisure time, I care for the UTPL, SQL, Java API, and the command line interface. Or I blog about development stuff. What I want to show today is how you can get started with testing a legacy project. I see many examples of how you start doing TDD or uh, unit testing on a fresh blank project. But in reality, we will have to deal with legacy code most of the time. I mean, let's face it, every piece of code you didn't visit in six months turns into legacy code. For some people like me, for example, it's more about six weeks. Uh, we have a demo project available. It's a legacy database from a galaxy far, far away, which organizes the Imperial Army. And therefore, I will be now Darth Sam. But do not be yeah. alarmed. He will only use his power for good. Yes, yes, of, of course, I will. The database uh, holds information about the different army groups and the soldiers belonging to them. It can also be used to create new groups. The database has no tests so far, and it contains logic of, uh, let's say, various quality. It's our job to improve it, make it more maintainable and readable, and for punishment amongst the Sith is uh, not an experience we want to make. We should be very careful with our improvements. And uh, now I'd like to share my screen. OK. Can you guys see it? I guess so. Uh, what we can see here is a list of groups and their names. Normally, they are named after their position inside their parent group. As you can see here, first team of third squad, etc. cetera. Um, exceptions are groups which have been given a special honor name. For example, the awesome UTPLSQL team, which is normally the third squad of the second platoon of the first company. You get it. Uh, when we look at the few, it's actually very verbose and complicated. It contains lots of logic. It contains calls to other views, which contain more logic and stuff. And uh, we will provide a link to the GitHub repository of this demo so you can go through all the examples and code. Uh, no need to try to get too much into details now. To make this functionality of the naming logic uh, more clear and more readable, we want to extract it and refactor it into a deterministic function. This. Uh, for we want to be sure that our function does what it should do, we are then creating a test package and use UTPLSQL to test this get group name function. Uh, 
Uh, first thing you might notice here is uh, that we have more comments than code. What a code smell. But actually, uh, these are necessary annotations for the UTP LSQL framework. Suit tells the framework that this package is actually a test package and it also provides an overall name. With suit path, we can group several different packages and the test annotation tells the framework that this specific procedure is an isolated test where we can also specify a description. The procedure itself is pretty simple. Uh, we are just using the public UTPLSQL uh, synonym and do an expectation. We expect that the result of our newly created function will equal a given text, a given value. And we do this for some edge cases. We do this several times until we had enough beer, actually. And uh, as you can see, UTPL SQL uses a fluid notation here, which might be a bit unusual for us PLSQL developers, but uh, uh, you can read it very smoothly and I like it very much. We can now run our tests. And we are sure that our new function works. The very good thing is that we didn't mess up anything. We just added a new package and made sure it works as expected. The bad thing, however, is that we didn't change anything. Our view still runs that old nasty case when functionality. So how can we assure we won't break anything when putting that, when putting that logic into the view? What we will do is actually creating a new view. And uh, as you can see, we changed literally everything. We included our new function here. We uh, changed lots of stuff. Uh, who can tell we didn't miss anything? Well, we can because we can now just compare our old and our new view by the minus and by uh, unine all. And if we run this, we will actually get no results. This approach is, of course, only viable if you have meaningful data in your development environment. Best would be production data, of course. But even if you not, you can just script that new view, install it on a production database and run the minus comparison without doing any harm. You're not breaking anything. You are just adding stuff you can easily remove later. The minus comparison is one of my favorite tools when I start to refactor an existing database project, maybe a few or a procedure which is doing stuff. Because you can do the same here. You can just create a new procedure, which is writing to a new table, for example, and then you can compare the results. One benefit we got by refactoring that groups view is that we now have a deeper understanding of the mechanics of the database. With that increased domain knowledge, we are now able to write real unit tests for our view. So we have a reliable and repeatable safety net for further improvements and refactorings. Uh, we have now two methods here, uh, one to set up our test data and one to test that our view returns the expected results. Setup is annotated with before all, which means that it's called once before all tests of that test package by the framework. And let's jump in. The, uh, the setup method will provide us with some test data. For most sequences, start at one, and I can assure that's the case in our project. We can securely add this test data by just using negative primary keys. 
Uh, UTP LSQL will roll back this test data once the test is done uh, completely automatically. We then added a little helper procedure to check the names of a given group by just selecting from the group view and then expecting several columns to uh, be equal to our given values. You have the same here. UT expect the uh, column name and we want to have it equal to what we have given as expected value. You can see that we don't repeat every case we did in the unit test for the group name function. We just want to make sure the mechanic is there. We don't want to pump up our tests as much as we can because uh, imagine what will happen when we want to change the, something. I at least can see the maintenance nightmare coming. Now we have a pretty little unit test for our few and we can refactor with confidence. You might have noticed that we don't have 3000 tests and uh, that we uh, might have some edge cases not covered. But you know what? That's okay. Honestly, if you deal with legacy projects, just start doing something. Just start improving it. There's this Boy Scout rule I like very much. Always leave the campground cleaner than you found it. That quote is also used in Clean Code, written by Robert C. Martin. And I really like the idea when we talk about dealing with legacy projects. It's not about recreating the whole project from scratch. It's not about getting 100% test coverage as a. I think it's about improving things as you come by. And I think it's about a specific mindset to see that, that things you, you can improve. Now that we improved our group's view and build a safety net around it, there is one more thing we want to do. We know a very powerful Sith Lord is about to start a battle soon and is very likely to raise a new army. For we are now in charge of that army database, we want to make very sure it will work once the Sith Lord uses it. You can guess why. That's, by the way, the pretty good indication of where to start creating automated tests. Just ask yourself, what will happen if this specific mechanic doesn't work? What's the impact? The more it hurts, the more likely you want it to be tested as often as possible. We want to make sure this uh, create field group function works because this is what the Sith Lord will be doing. I want to have a new powerful group. I don't care how. And therefore, we create a new test package for it. Uh, we, uh, we will test creating a new squad because this is still kind of simple to test but uses all the mechanic we need even for creating larger groups. It should have the minimum number of soldiers defined for that group type, and it should have a leader which, is, which at least has the rank of a sergeant. Um, first of all, we make sure we have enough unemployed soldiers of the right rank available. Uh, again, they will be eliminated by UTP LSQL automatically after the test is done, so we are not polluting our database. We then call the factory method and use several selects to other public API, API functions to check the results. We are uh, checking the label to uh, check if our type is correct. We try to get the leader and check if it has the right rank. And we are also checking that our, that our uh, members of the group are uh, inside the expected min and max range. With the other test, as you can see, we assure that if we have not enough soldiers to create a new group, 
we will be given a specific exception. That way, a potential error message might not please the Sith Lord, but it won't make us look bad. Um, we can achieve this by just adding this neat little throws annotation. UTPLSQL will do the rest. We did all of this checking by using functions of the public API, and we tried to avoid checking internals of the database project. That way, we allow future refactorings and still give meaningful safety. We try to act like the Sith Lord and just check the things we really care about. We don't care about the group's ID or the internal structure of the new group. If we wanted to fixate that internal structure, by the way, we would do it within a separate unit test. We are now finally in the comfortable situation to assure that several important things of our database will work when the Sith Lord arrives. Just run our tests. And we can see here four tests, zero failed. Very good, because that means that we are much less likely to get strangled. And with that, I'd like to hand over to Pavel. Thanks, Stefan. Thanks, Samuel. That was a lot of fun. I don't think I've ever been addressed by a, a Sith Imperial Lord before during, during one of our sessions. Uh, Pavel, just before you get started, I do have two questions that have come in. One of them will wait for the end. Uh, one of them, though, might you'll probably want to cover in your talk. So you recommend each developer should develop locally. This means each developer has Oracle installed locally. Is this worth the licensing cost? And um, so, Pavel, I know you're going to be talking about CloneDB and multiple uh, databases. You, you're welcome to address that as you'd like. Now, let's go over to Pavel. Hello, Hello everyone. <laughs> yep. Hello everyone. My name is Pavel, uh, and in real life, I'm a PLSQL developer for about 10 years. Uh, I work as a data warehouse architect in a Russian company called Dysoft, uh, and I'm also a co-author of the UT PLSQL, PLSQL testing framework. But today, I'm a Sith Lord engineer responsible for continuous integration pipeline for the Imperial Army management application with SAP. Sam showed us how we can introduce tests to a legacy project and make a safe refactoring. Uh, and now uh, we need to automatically execute this test so that after every change, we're sure that the code works as expected and we have not introduced any bug. Uh, that is what continuous integration made for. Next slide, please. Uh, the demo pipeline I'm going to show you consists of several steps. Uh, as we are going to execute the tests uh, after each change, it means on each commit, on each branch, we need a separate reproducible clean environment, uh, which is called uh, continuous integration database in the slide. Uh, it is important because our test may pollute on execution if they, for example, perform DDL statements. Uh, the framework um, cares about the DML stuff with the rollback technique, but if we perform DDL statements, we need to, uh, we may pollute the environment. Uh, and we will discuss how to create such environment shortly. But let, let's now go through all the steps. Uh, the second one is we're going to download and install UTPL SQL testing framework uh, for environment. Then we're going to check out uh, the source codes of our application and install test packages. Uh, afterwards, we're going to run the tests, gather the results, gather reports, and also measure the code coverage of the executed tests. Next one, please. Uh, Stefan showed us how we can reverse engineer the schema from production and generate DDL statements to create and let's call it empty database. Unfortunately, 
for some projects, it might be difficult to extract, uh, let's say, the minimum set of static data like settings, configurations, the stuff that is needed for application to run, not only the schema, but also this small amount of data. And this is especially true for legacy application, legacy projects. Uh, what are the opportunities? Of course, make a copy of our production database uh, with all the data in it and call it test environment. But there are several disadvantages of such approach. The first one is a storage. Your legacy application might be quite big and it will require a huge amount of disk to store uh, these full-size copies. And the second one is time. Uh, as we discussed, we're going to recreate the continuous integration re uh, environment before each run. So we have to be able to make it quick. ClonDB is the technology that comes to rescue. Uh, ClonDB is an Oracle database built-in technology that was introduced in 11.2, but not a lot of people are aware about it. Uh, ClonDB allows us to create a logical database copy from a read-only backup. It uses uh, copy and write processing, which means that it writes, di writes data only when it is changed. Uh, and uh, it allows all kinds of operations like DML, DDL, gathering statistics, in-memory processing, partitioning, everything that you can imagine you can do with an ordinary uh, instance. In fact, for, from the user perspective, it is an ordinary instance. Uh, and also, you can reuse the same read-only backup to create multiple ClonDB instances. Just imagine, if you have a one terabyte backup, big application, one terabyte, and you are going to create 10 development environments, uh, the, with the disk requirements will be around zero, because until you change anything, they wait nothing. And you're not going to change a lot on your development and test environment. Uh, our Sith Lord uh, application, our Imperial Army management application, is about one gigabyte. I've enlarged it a bit. Uh, and we're going to use ClonDB technology in our continuous integration pipeline. Uh, and let me dive into the demo. So. Can you give me the screen, Stefan? Uh, Steven? Can you take it now? Mm. Nope. You're the presenter? Yes, now I can. OK. Yep. Can you see it? Yes. Can you see the screen? Yes. Yes. Great. So uh, we have our, our Sith Lord application uh, and we have our build, uh, build homepage. We see a history of the builds and we see that the last build is broken. We can dive into and investigate the reason. We see that there were one test failure and we can get into it and see that this test uh, was broken. And if we uh, dig into, then we see that the actual value that was returned in the test was like a mistype here, and we were expected to be our team name. So we're gonna fix it. It's a small fix. Save it to the version control and commit and push it. We commit it and we so now the change is um, stored in the version control. Come on. Come on. Uh-oh, it's the demo the, the, gods. This is, yeah, this is really you must strange. Use your machine immediately. Oh, at least we have uh, successful builds previously. I think we can go through them. 
This is strange. <laughs> Let's try it again, but if it won't help, then we'll just go through previously completed builds. Let's look how it is configured. Uh, so it's the name of our build. Uh, we have configured the uh, ch checking out the, the Git repository to check out the sources of our application and then the build itself. So the clone DB, these two lines is all you need to drop your previously created clone DB instance. We're going to use uh, Oracle. 11, or Oracle 12.2, so we will use uh, PDB technology, pluggable database technology for the ClonedB task. These two lines drop previously created uh, ClonedB instance, and these two lines create a new one. So this is all you need. If I have a um, base PDB, then I create a new ClonedB instance that uh, with all the data in it and open it. Then we are going to download and install UTPLSQL uh, source codes from GitHub, and we install it into the schema. Then we install our tests. Uh, both installation are made with the SQL client from Oracle. So we install our test packages, and then we run them. Uh, to run the test, the most convenient tool is the UTPLSQL client, which Shams works on. Uh, it is a command line utility to, to run tests and to provide a configuration with this convenient style. So we ask the framework to perform a uh, documentation reporter, which, is, which means report everything to the console uh, and prepare X unit report that Jenkins can, get, can understand and analyze. Also create coverage HTML report and put it into the file. And then we save the coverage report as an artifact of the build. Uh, if we look through the last successful build, uh, what we can see is test results. So test, uh, the, the test results are, understand, are understood by Jenkins. We can see all the tests that, the trend, the the duration of each test, and also uh, we can see the coverage metrics. Here we see that our three packages are very well, I would say, perfectly covered with tests. But the group management package is not that well covered, and we can dig into it and see what lines were covered by test which means what lines were executed while we executed our tests. And we see that this one is only partly executed. And that procedure, it seems like it was not tested at all. These, these all are not tested at all. So uh, with this small demo, I think I've showed you how easy it is to configure such uh, th this kind of pipeline. And I hang back to Steven. Pavel, before we do, before you yep. do, just a quick question from my side. You showed the code coverage, and there was this yellow line about uh, partly covered. Can you say what this is about? I think it was somewhere here. Yes, definitely. Uh, the Oracle 12.2 introduced its own uh, coverage um, package, let's say, which allows uh, to measure a block coverage. Block coverage means that if there are if statement, for example, with an or, uh, we can distinguish have we covered each uh, parts of the or statement or only one of them. And if we have covered only one part of the or statement and the second was never executed, then it the if statement is covered. And this is displayed as a yellow ra yellow uh, line in this HTML coverage report. Seven. Thanks, Pavel. So uh, let's see, before we move on to Yasek and we have a sort of a roundtable conversation finishing up our time together, and thank, thanks to all the presenters for staying on the mark time-wise. I did have a question uh, for Stefan, but of course anyone can answer it from slide 10. Let's go back to slide 10. And the question is, 
I would like to know how Jenkins is able to recognize among all the DDL, DML, and code files, which ones to grab for a given release being pushed to a developer's sandbox. No, I was muted. I don't know if you see it, but I thought I already answered it. Can you see this? So in fact, we are deploying always the whole schema. If something changed uh, in a schema, yeah, then we are dropping and recreating the whole schema. This only takes uh, two minutes, maybe. And we don't check uh, each file, or we don't uh, deploy only the, the changed file. We always deploy the complete schema. OK. So it's a complete replacement, so there's no need to be selectively picking out which files to run. Yeah. And I know that there are some tools like Liquibase and Flyaway that give you the ability to create um, segment, seg segmented scripts that will only apply changes, but that's not the approach that you took here. No, not in this place. Yeah. All righty. Then let's hand it over to Yasek, and let's finish up with a, with a conversation among friends about testing. So hi, hi everyone. I'm Yasek Gebel. I'm uh, database engineer since 1998. Uh, so when I was starting, uh, Stephen was already thinking about UTP or SQL version one. Uh, yes, but on one, that... one second. You look, it looks like you're very dark. We can't see you. Are you sharing your webcam? Um, yes, I am. I can't see you. You can? I can see him pretty good. My apologies. Good Go right ahead. Okay. <laughs> Looks like a, a Dark Lord's got you, Stephen. <laughs> um, so, uh, so I just started when uh, my my career with uh, UTP or SQL with PL SQL when when Stephen was already thinking about UTP or SQL, uh, and uh, for many years I did database development both on the data warehousing and uh, OLTP systems, uh, but actually I got infected with unit testing about six years ago and that that was the time when i started contributing to ruby PL sql which was the framework i was using at that time and uh, around two years ago we gathered together with a few few guys including pavel and decided to do utp sql version 3 as a rewrite of of the original framework so um my original plan was to talk about why and what and how would you test, but uh, I think the, the part that was presented by Pavel and Stefan and uh, Sam were much more uh, intriguing and, and thorough. So uh, I guess we can just go into the round table and talk about different mindsets or different things I heard about unit testing and uh, quotes I came along uh, through last years of experiences with testing and how do we go about those? So I don't know, Stephen, would you like to, to go through through them one by one or should we just, should I lead them? Yeah, okay, I'll do that. All right, so there are many people, many things people say about unit testing, and one of the things that I often see when you start or introduce unit testing into your company, and you say, "Oh, you know," and we have this framework which allows us to uh, gather code coverage, and then your manager starts to look at the code coverage, and they say, "Oh, yeah, there is a metric we can measure how good our code is." So let's just expect 100% code coverage, or let's think about code coverage as the ultimate quality check of your of your software. So uh, I heard people saying, "Well, if we don't have 100% code coverage, the, the code is not good not good to go to prod." So how would you go about this kind of statement? Um. Maybe I start because uh, you all know I'm not a big fan of code coverage at all. <laughs> I actually think it's uh, a very overrated metric. It, uh, in in my opinion, you you can uh, you can go very very good and very very safe without ever doing code coverage. It can show you some things. It can uh, give you some indications about where your blind spots might be, but 
I wouldn't take code coverage at all as 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 very quality metric. There there are other things which would be much more important, like. Uh, uh, how much of our use cases are actually covered with uh, with tests but that's a, a thing you can't easily easily get and therefore it's it's a bit like like uh, lines of code and, and stuff it, it can be very useful but uh, i don't think you really need it i will oh, also interruption. sorry so my my go to meeting died. That's why I, I dropped away and came back. And I cannot seem to share my screen. So if one of you, Shiasik, if you could share the, um, I guess the PowerPoint that I sent you folks, I'll see if I can recover what's going on with my screen sharing. But in any case, we don't have the list of controversies, right? Uh, I'll try to share now. Just give me one minute. All right. uh, so I'll, I'll read it. I'll read out the next one. I think we talked about the first one, right? Either we get to 100% test coverage or it's not worth doing. So another one is every unit of code must have unit tests. Everything must have a test. What do you think? No, I don't think so. That's right. Um, if, if there's code which is really easy to understand and um, you don't have to do a test here maybe if it's really obvious or if you have code which is very complex, yeah, then you have to test it, yeah, but you don't need to 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 test everything there maybe. Yeah? Imagine you have uh, the join over six tables, yeah, so you, your test must have the join of each table, but not every possibility of each NVL statement or whatever, yeah, because this test will become so big you will never read it again and nobody else can understand it. And so you have to think about how much do I really want to test here? And I think uh, in, in, in very complex statements, it's, it's enough to test 80% maybe, yeah. And I would also like to add that uh, if we talk about uh, database testing, we have a very different thing, which is declarative detail statement. And uh, there, there is no need to test, let's say, the add column statement, right? So there are declarative stuff like constraints, unique constraints, uh, not null constraints, um, data manipulation, like creating new tables, adding columns, and we should not test uh, exactly this. We should focus on testing the logic that operates using these objects. Yes, so don't, fact, don't write the test that the, ta that the column exists after you executed outer table statement. I, I remember two years ago, we, we had this kind of test that we tested that the columns are there and uh, we get rid of them after one year because it was senseless, <laughs> useless. <laughs> Well, I think in a way the answer to this, the, the response around the second line is similar to the first one. It, it Perhaps in some sort of perfect world, it'd be great to have a test for every single thing. But in practice, you want to focus on the points of pain. And Samuel mentioned this in the context of, you know, who's looking over your shoulder when the Sith Lord is requiring you to do something, you're going to make sure it's right because the consequences are so severe. And so I think what you want to do is essentially prioritize the writing of your tests around severity of failure. If this one fails, we are in bad shape. So let's make sure this one's solid. OK, Yasek, next. Yeah, so the next one is, well, we need a full copy of production data for testing. No, um, no. And actually, I can, <laughs> <laughs> actually, I can take this. Uh, uh, actually, you could start. Uh, what, what you really need is not a full, date, a full copy of production data. You need meaningful data that will allow you to test thoroughly. and by meaningful, I think, you know, if, you're, if your production database is one terabyte or 20 terabytes or even one gigabyte, why would you bother copying the data? Not to mention the risk and security of, I don't know, exposing user uh, usernames, their addresses, emails, phone numbers. You don't want to, to even see this data on dev because then you, if you see that, somebody might say, well, actually, if there is a data leak, maybe it was you who leaked the data. So if you if you don't see the data, it's better for you. You're on a safe side, right? Nobody will ever say hey, it's actually your fault that we had the data leak because it leaked out Fair from point. dev, right? So so when it comes to security, don't even think about copying prod data. Actually, you you probably what you could get away with either is generated data, 
and there are quite a few great test uh, test data generators out there that you can look at and, and try to generate your test data if you have time for this but when dealing with legacy projects maybe just trim down the data maybe make it uh, one one tenth of a side of a size just make sure it's good enough to give you confidence that when you test it it, it runs see i'm yeah, I'm not a fan of of, of uh, using test data generators, you which are. Run, you want your test to run quickly, so if you've got it, massive amounts of data to mimic production, you're going to sit there while your test is churning through their, their, their steps. Okay, uh, and in terms of test data, last year we also had a fellow named Morton Broughton, Morton Egan, on. He's the PL SQL Ninja, so search for PL SQL Ninja. He's developed a whole bunch of different packages including one that generates random test data. And I think that that could be really helpful for you. And I think he has he been in touch with the UTPL SQL project as well. We Great. had a chat with him last year. Yes. Okay. Great. All right. Next, because we're running out of time. It takes too long to write tests. Yeah. Who's got uh, time to write tests? <laughs> check, well, out my, you, check out I, my Excel I, tool. It doesn't take long. <laughs> <laughs> and if you if you don't write tests, how long it takes to fix the bugs that you have? Is it really faster? And and what's the consequence of not writing those tests? Or if it's hard for you to write your tests and you you created the code, will it be faster for I don't know a QA person who doesn't know how these things work to test it? It will be probably not faster. I, I wouldn't assume black box testing is faster than white box testing, which we talk about here. So you as an engineer, as the author, you know you know what you've written and should should be most probably easiest for you to test it. There's also so in other words, one I thing think I practically I speak. I, I, uh, Go I, uh, there's there's one thing I I'd like to add, add because uh, we always assume that we have bugs because it's our fault and if we do correctly all the time uh, we, we don't need tests, but that's wrong. Uh, actually, we can have a situation where something, uh, some, someone else is doing a mistake because we often rely on different data, on different uh, API and stuff. We have no control about that. And if we have a, a strong and solid test environment and test uh, a base, we can even catch those because in the end, it will always impact our software and our product because customers don't naturally distinct if it's your fault or the fault of the API which uh, gives you the data. It's just your project, your uh, pro product, and if it's not working, it's not working. Here's a comment from one of the attendees. I'm lucky I have a test database that rolls over from prod every night. Even with 21 years of data, we're very small. This has made testing a dream. What has also helped is making sure every script has gross tests right in the script. I've been writing tests for years, thanks to Steven. And since a full install script must run cleanly in the test database before scheduling production installs, we also have a log of all test results for every run of the master install script. Nice, congratulations, Suzanne. All right, next, next controversial statement. I think this one is... Uh, coming uh, back to what Pavel and, and Stefan were talking about in terms of environment being stable for testing. Uh, so we can't, uh, we can't run tests because our environment is unstable, so the tests always fail. Uh, and I often run into this situation where we, uh, when, we, when we have shared database, right? we have shared data dev development database and multiple users engineers use it to develop their code there's always someone messing with something and leaving something dirty so you can't actually rely on that database to run your tests uh, so what you actually need is an isolated and clean database at least one clean database that you can run your tests on and then even if your development database isn't in a you know mint shape you still at least needs the, the environment that you're testing on should be should be as clean as production. I would like to add that by by clean we also uh, we need not only clean but reproducible clean environment, right? So 
it is clean before every run. And we can achieve this by two ways. Either we can uh, rebuild it from scratch or before every run, or we can establish something like a snapshot where we can use CloneDB. Either it is produced from production or from generated test data, but it takes it about, about an hour to gener generate this kind of base uh, image. But then we uh, create a CloneDB snapshot. We use it for test, then we drop it it from scratch then use it for tests and drop recreate it so we can all right sorry yeah so we're out of time it's 1201 so what i want to do is go through the last couple of slides pretty quickly i'll take the lead on it and you guys can plug in additional comments just to run it as smoothly as we can so the last topic here was as long as we do application testing we don't need to do unit testing i like this one i i tend to like to believe it myself the bottom line is that yes, in the end, you're delivering applications to users. So if you're you're testing that endpoint, you could say we're we've got it covered. But the problem there is if you have bugs and they're buried down deep in your units, it's very hard to start from a bug that is measured as manifested at the application level and trace it all the way back to that unit. It's much more productive, much more friendly to your users if you're verifying the correctness of your units and then building solid applications on top. Okay. Should we move along to our, our last slide of a bunch of different tips? And like I say, why don't I just go through these? You guys can pitch in if I miss anything. So number one, as mentioned earlier and shown, get your database into version control, uh, either scripts, you can even be version controlling data in some ways, uh, but don't just have your, your code, for example, just in the database, not inside files, not inside version control, then you've completely lost control of your application. Set up your environments for your data so your developers have safe sandbox in which they can make changes, they can play around, they can develop without worrying about stepping on each other's toes. And here's a tip that I found really useful in terms of getting started with testing. Sometimes it's just so intimidating to even like go into some sort of tool to start building out your, your test cases and defining all that stuff. Just ask yourself a question the next time you're about to start writing a new piece of code. How will I know when I'm done? You're writing code and then at some point you stop. Something tells you you're done. So ask yourself that question, write down the answers. You might turn them into UTPL SQL test suites or some other mechanism for testing, but at least you'll have thought through about what that program is supposed to do and that'll orient you, I think, much more clearly around writing it productively and, and testing it. As we mentioned, don't worry about getting to 100% test coverage, get started. Just focus on the next test you want to write and you'll just build up that library of tests as you go. And another nice tip to help drive the increase in testing. The next time you have a bug to fix, write a test first. So the first thing you should do when somebody reports a bug is reproduce it. And that reproduction of a, of a bug becomes a test case. And by reproducing it first and building it into your test suite, then you know you fixed it when you apply a fix. And you know that you're not regressing because you can run that test over and over again. Um, and finally, for, a tip for around that, unit test. For that, for, for that point, also, don't underestimate the benefit of use of, of using writing tests to get your project known better, to uh, use it as tool to increase your domain knowledge, because in the end, that's the knowledge which, uh, which is important, not the technique, it's the domain knowledge. And testing is a wonderful tool to get into something, especially if it's uh, legacy code. The only documentation I trust are the tests. <laughs> are the tests, not the code. And, uh, and the final point actually goes right back to what Samuel was saying. Just as we like to do code reviews to share domain knowledge about the application, do reviews of the tests. Here are the things I want to test. What am I missing? What should I be, what should I be focusing on? And that will help improve your knowledge and the knowledge of your team around that domain. All right, some final links or a, a page of links for you to follow up with. Um, if you want to check out Samuel's uh, Sith demo, you can go to this URL, github.com, look for Pessy, which is his, his nickname, and there's the presentation as well. There are a number of links for UTPL SQL. Of course, you should be able to just search any of this out uh, using your Google or whatever, and uh, download UTPL SQL, give it a try. There are other unit testing tools as well. SQL Developer has integrated unit testing, Toad, the Toad uh, suite comes with a code tester for Oracle. Um, UTPL SQL is the dominant open source framework with which you can use, and it's certainly 
being used by a lot of organizations around the world. Follow all these folks on Twitter, stay up to date on testing, and feel free to ask them questions about using UTPL SQL through Twitter or otherwise, uh, and that'll help the project move along as well. All right, well, we are well out of time. Thanks for sticking with us. Thanks to all of you for, for sharing your expertise around testing. And uh, we look forward to hearing about all of your stories about successful testing of your Oracle database code. Thanks, everybody. Happy coding. Happy coding. Bye-bye. Thank you. And Karen, we'd like to bring you back on. All right. Thank you all for joining us today. Thank you, Stephen, as usual. And uh, thank you for, to the attendees. Everybody have a good rest of your day. Thanks. Thanks, Thank Karen. Ready. Bye, everybody. Bye.